morning. We're going to go ahead and get started. The first presenter is Jason Wynn, and he's going to be presenting intraocular lens power adjust adjustment by femtosecond laser. Okay. My name is Jason Wynn. I'm one of the fellows in Dr. Mamlis and Dr. Warner's lab. And uh, for those of you that were here on Friday, uh, Dr. Mamlis touched briefly on this subject, but I'm excited to um, talk a little bit more in detail about this novel technology of power adjustment by femtosecond laser. So the overview of the talk, um, I'm going to start out talking about some of the background research done by the Perfect Lens Company, and then uh, transition into talking to about two of the studies that we've done here in our lab, one in vitro and one an animal study. So why do we need IOL power adjustment? Well, incorrect IOL power is one of the most frequent reasons for IOL exchange. Um, in some years, it's up to 20 to 40 percent the cause of the explantation. Um, in a study of 298 patients, uh, only 45 percent of patients emerged with a refraction within half a diopter of the target. In a much larger study, only 72 percent emerged within one diopter of the target. And uh, in that same study, 6.5 percent were beyond two diopters, so there's quite a broad range. Another um, reason why we need IOL power adjustment is just the growing needs and expectations for good vision. Um, nowadays, the patient population expects more perfect vision or freedom from glasses, and this is evidenced by just the increased usage of premium IOLs, uh, up to 14% of cataract surgeries today, and the increasing number of refractive procedures. So what can power adjustment do? So the refractive properties of an IOL can be customized even after uh, implantation, and this can adjust for surgical or measurement error. And um, in the future, we hope that this is something that can be done very quick in office and not require any type of OR time. Okay. So next, I want to talk about some of the background theory uh, that has been proposed. So um, refractive index changes by femtosecond laser have been experimented with in different materials in previous years. Um, up to, or affecting up to a change of 0 0.056 in glass and 0 0.06 in hydrogel. And some of the proposed mechanisms just behind uh, how it happens is uh, the light from the laser induces cross-linking within the material, and this therefore um, increases the refractive index. Or another one that has been proposed is just the local heat effects from the laser causing a phase separation in the material and then thereby affecting the refractive index. But the one I wanted to focus on today is the one that the Perfect Lens Company has used, and that's just um, using the femtosecond laser to treat an area which will cause that area to uh, increase in hydrophilicity. And once that treated area has been um, treated, we see that it absorbs water, and the absorption of water causes a uh, decrease in refractive index. Okay. And to um, demonstrate the hydrophilicity change, I wanted to talk about the wetting angle measurement technique. So here we have an IOL with um, two separate drops of water. Here on the left, the angle on this drop of water is at 64 degrees, which tells us that it's in contact with the hydrophilic surface. So that area has been treated. And the angle on the right here is at 87 degrees. So that tells us it's in contact with the hydrophobic surface. Okay, and then uh, what's interesting about this figure is actually both of these areas are treated, but both of the drops are at an angle of 87 degrees, so it tells us that it's still in, con in contact with the hydrophobic surface. So what happened here is actually the treated area is only within the IOL. So even though the um, inner substance of the IOL is hydrophilic, the outside is still in contact with the hydrophobic surface. So essentially what they've done is created an IOL within an IOL. So how do they create this IOL within an IOL? It's not this. <laughs> but it's by utilizing what's called a phase wrap structure. And what a phase wrap structure is, is um, essentially they create concentric diffractive zones. And within these diffractive zones, each of those zones has a uh, individual power. And the summation of each of those rings uh, comes to a total IOL power. And that's how they affect the um, diopter change. And what's unique about the phase wrap structure is by utilizing this technique, you can contain the entire curvature of a convex or a concave lens in one layer. As you can see here in the figure, um, you have a side view, a top view, 
And this is in C, it's a 3D view. So you can see how thin it is. It's all in one layer. And this is important because when you uh, make this IOL with an IOL, you only have about 200 micrometers of space to work with. So um, in effect, you're able to have a very significant refractive change in a very small area. As you can see here, uh, with a refractive index change of 0 0.01 in a conventional lens, you only have about 0.4 diopters change. But in the same index change in a phase-wrapped lens, you have up to 3.3 .3 diopters change. Okay, and this is um, just a quick figure I wanted to go over uh, the basic setup of the Perfect Lens Company. They start with the laser and it's delivered through um, and shaped to the Galvel scanner. And through the Galvel scanner, it goes through an objective lens to where the IOL sits here. And the bottom figure here is just a image of the IOL holder. And I wanted to emphasize that just because uh, what we talked about earlier. It has to be immersed in water because um, once the lens is treated, it has to absorb water to affect that refractive change. Otherwise, there really is no change at all. And uh, this next slide is just quickly summarizing the results. So the company experimented with both reduction and increase in diopter. And you can see that even with the di different increments, they got very close to all their targets. And the next, they experimented with nine different IOLs, and they wanted to just assess how repeatable it was. As you can see in both the chart and the table, um, not only is the process very repeatable, but it's very accurate. So next, I wanted to transition and talk about some of the uh, studies we've been doing in our own lab. And um, it's been related to basically looking at before and after the light scattering uh, effects and the light transmittance effects of the process. So up here um, in the top left, we have um, a model I. What we do is we put the I or uh, the IOL in this model I, and we place it here in the Shine Fluke camera, and then we assess for light scattering values. And in the bottom uh, left here, we have a cuvette. We insert the IOL in the cuvette, and the cuvette goes into this spectrophoton. Sorry, just can't quite get it, but it goes into the spectrophotometer, and we assess for light transmittance. Okay, and just this slide, I quickly wanted to just show kind of that phase wrap structure that has been affected after the treatment. You can see those concentric rings. And next, with light scattering, so what we did is we looked at the light scattering values for uh, the anterior and posterior surfaces of the IOL, along with the inner substance of the IOL. So actually on the after here, oops, the after, you can kind of see that phase wrap structure in the after treatment and you can see those rings. But um, what's important is that even though after treatment there was a little change in um, the light scattering values, especially in the inner substance of the IOL, according to previous publications, uh, it's not expected to have any type of visually significant effects. And here is the before and after of the light transmittance curves. Once again, you can see there's a very small change, but once again, no uh, visually significant effects are expected. And uh, this chart kind of wraps up our data from the mature study. What we looked at was just the change in diopters and the uh, change in MTF. And MTF is the modulation transfer function. And what the MTF is, is essentially the quality of the optic, or um, more specifically, how well the contrast is transferred from the object to the image. And what, in summary, what we saw is we saw a very real change and accurate change in diopters without a very significant change at all in MTF. And to kind of conclude, I wanted to talk a little bit about the rabbit study, the preliminary rabbit studies that we've been doing, uh, our little patients. Um, we started with two rabbits, and we implanted a hydrophobic acrylic lens, just commercially available in both eyes. And we performed a slit lamp, and they were unremarkable at week one. And the company came in and brought their laser, and they performed some just prelim tests to kind of figure out their parameters. And after the words, we uh, explained in the lens, and we sent it back to the company for further analysis. And with this picture, um, kind of wanted just to show the setup. So here we have 
what we were looking at, essentially just positioning the rabbits. Uh, we were trying to test the docking of the laser system to the actual rabbit eye. And what we found for results was that um, the docking system was very appropriate on the rabbit. It took quite a while, but we did eventually figure it out. Um, and on the other results, the company was able to uh, figure out some of the parameters they needed for future tests. So they were able to kind of figure out exactly what they needed for the deaf position of the lens in the eye, or the, uh, the repetition rate for the laser, or just how much any energy absorption was taken out by the cornea. So from here, uh, what we plan on doing is to experiment with some more of the long-term biocompatibility of the treatment, and then just to see how well the treatment does in living tissue. Okay, and to kind of wrap up, obviously with something like this, it can be very powerful if it becomes mainstream. Um, we can use it in adult cataract surgery for immediate uh, quick adjustment in office for ideal lens power to account for surgical errors, eye will tilt, decentration. And we can also use it in pediatric cataract surgery because as a child's eyes change with time, this process actually can be done multiple times. So we can adjust as uh, their eyes change. And the, I think the most important thing is this is widely applicable. Um, you can actually do this process in any type of hydrophobic acrylic lens. So as opposed to some of the other things on the market, um, this really, you could use it in many different cases. And I'd like to thank Dr. Mamlis, Dr. Warner, my co-fellows, Joe and Jason, and my references, and any questions? Dr. Betty? Um, so the MTF values, um, you know how those compare to a multifocal lens um, with concentric rings? Uh, and if you don't, maybe uh, Nick or Liliana does. And, and why, why, if there um, is a big difference, why does this not affect MTF as much? So I didn't get that last part, I'm sorry. Why is the MTF? So with, with MTF value, uh, quality, right? Yes. Um, with a typical multifocal lens, uh, what are those values compared to these values? And if there is a difference, why is that? Okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm not quite sure. So, Jeff, actually, um, the MPF values were measured before and after treatment, and it's like a monofocal lens. Okay. The change was like insignificant. So, it compares much better to an uh, MPF of a multifocal lens because actually, multifocal lens has refractive rings on the surface, anterior posterior depends on the company. This is within the substance of the lens, and, and it's different. Everything is one single layer, so it's a very different mechanism. So MPF is like one of them. Another question. Just really quickly. Um, have we done any longitudinal studies to see how long and and is it really possible that over a lifetime this could be adjusted for pediatric patients? So I mean, um, I can just comment what was done so far. The majority of the projects is still in the in vitro phase, and now we started the in vitro. But in theory, this can be adjustable multiple times. So we have to do, of course, the biocompatibility studies to see if there is no bleaching of some kind of polymer or something, but in theory, with the technique itself, it can be throughout a lifetime. And it's interesting because if you think about the Calhoun project, you have limits, right? So once you lock in the lens, it's done. And with the Calhoun project, you have to wear those UV glasses for two weeks after surgery. With that, you don't need anything. With the Calhoun, you need a specific lens. This one is in the lens. So it could be quite you know, the, the advantage of this of this technology is, is just the fact that you can use it on any lens. And so on the light adjustable lens, you have to choose that patient ahead of time, put only that lens in, and then adjust it later. This could be anybody who's had cataract surgery with a lens in there at any time afterward. And this would work on, you know, modifying the surface of that. And this is not a technology that has to be locked in like you do with the light adjustable lens. And so at least in theory, you could do multiple changes on this, and that would be really advantageous, especially in, in a child who has you know, an implant placed at an early age, and then of course their eye grows as they get older, and it changes the refractive error, and so you could be able to 
adjust that lens multiple times as the child grows older. Um, similarly, people are starting to think totally out of the box. You could put a multifocal pattern on this IOL and see how the patient does. And then if the patient has significant dysphotopsias and other issues with it, you could literally reverse it and put it back to where they were. And so this has a broad potential on, on what could be done with this technology. What percentage of U.S. lenses are hydrophilic? Um, so I don't know the number offhand, but I would say at least 90%, just, just off the top of my head. I think that if I remember correctly, it may not work with hydrophobic. Oh, I'm sorry, hydrophobic yeah. or 90%. Yeah. Right, so maybe 10% of the people could have this in the U.S. at least. No, I mean, it could work with any lens, yeah. uh, but not hydrophilic. Just not hydrophilic, but it works on hydrophobic. The majority of the market, yeah. I think, is hydrophobic. Right, that's what I think. 